away from Bokota Village in Limpopo, South Africa, we bring you Missionary Minds, where you can learn about family, church history, biblical worldview issues, and of course, missions. All from the mind of a real-world missionary of almost 20 years. But today, the real-world missionary is not here, our usual Butipo Schley line. I instead am privileged to have a guest in here, and this is Pastor Matt White from Belcroft Bible Church. And I want to just have a conversation about masculinity and manhood, especially as a first-generation Christian. As I'm trying to learn the ropes, I spend time with families and I learn a lot from them and from the godly husbands and godly men I spend time with in the church and I'm really thankful for those opportunities. Do you mind just introducing yourself a bit, telling us a little bit about your family, when you, uh, the age you got saved at and when you got married, the number of children? Yeah, no, thanks brother. It's good to be with you. It's an honor and privilege to be here in South Africa and we're humbled to be here to serve you guys and to serve alongside you and grateful for this opportunity. Yes, I've been uh, married for almost 28 years. I think that's right. My wife's not with me. She's usually my go-to on keeping track of the numbers. It's been so long I've forgotten, but I think 28 years is right. Um, We have four children. Ages of our children are 20 years old, uh, 18 years old, 14 years old, and eight years old. We have a good spread there, and there's a reason for that. And we have two girls, those are the older ones, and two boys. That's the way they line out. Their names are uh, Sydney, Allison, Christian, and Hunter. And uh, love them, love our family, humbled to be the father of this family and the husband of my precious wife, whose name's Amy. Um, yeah, it's been a blessing. I've been a pastor at Belcroft Bible Church now for uh, going on eight years. It's just outside of Washington, D.C., in across on the Maryland side. And uh, it's been a real blessing even to have our children there and to raise them and to be a family there together. A little interesting story here that thrills my heart. We were uh, probably about a year a year and a half into our transition from Los Angeles to Maryland and taking on this church and and uh, was coming home with my daughters from a, a, a kind of a co-ops homeschool gathered event and on our way home we were talking and just literally unprovoked by me both my girls started to uh, tell me how excited they were to be at this church and how excited they were to be there in Maryland. And as a father, that that thrilled me because we were still in that zone of trying to figure out how how this transition was going to be for my children, especially my daughters, because they were at the early teenage years, which is a which is a potentially tumultuous time when you're transitioning from you know from the West Coast to the East Coast and all of the transitions that happens when you're moving like we had to move and moving you know, buying a new house and new people and every new culture, everything. And so uh, that was uh, that was a big deal for me to see my teenage girls uh, share that uh, unprovoked. And yeah, as a blessing. So, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful, brother. And do you mind sharing a little bit about how you came to know the Lord and at yes. what age? Yeah. So I'm a second generation Christian. My uh, family, my parents were both first generation. My dad was raised Jehovah's Witness did not become a believer until he, right before he went to Vietnam. And that even uh, through uh, the influence of even my uh, mom and and her mom. Um, But yeah, so I was raised in a a, a Christian home. It was very traditionally fundamentalist. uh, I would say pretty hardcore fundamentalist. That was kind of how I was raised up, King James only kind of in that vein. And uh, which was common in where I was from on the East Coast. I was a very common theological framework in that day uh, in the 70s. And so, uh, but that's that's kind of my heritage. So I, I grew up hearing the gospel from that perspective, obviously, and uh, but did not grow to a 
personal conviction of my own sin and the depth of it and my need for Christ until my latter teen years. I made a profession of faith as a as a young boy, probably eight, nine years old. And uh, but uh, don't really consider that the point of regeneration in my life until that uh, point later on in my teenage years uh, that I truly was broken over my sin, truly saw the depth of the wretchedness of my sin and truly saw Christ as the answer to my sin. And it was then that I turned uh, from my sins and turned in true faith to Christ and giving him my life, seeking to live under his lordship um, every day of my life, be it imperfectly. And so, yeah, and um, really in that moment, which was a pretty, um, uh, shall I say, drastic event in my life at that point where I had recognized my rebellion and my wickedness and then recognized my the wrath I deserved, but recognized the grace I had been given by the Lord. It overwhelmed me overwhelmed me to a point of I reached this point where I you know in my prayer to the Lord was either kill me or save me I'm just that broken and obviously the Lord in his grace would save me and uh, as he will save all who will come to him in repentant faith and and the Lord was kind to do that and in that conversion my the only thing I could give back to the Lord was my life And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to give him everything I had and everything I could ever be and do. And so I made a commitment at that point to serve the Lord. It wasn't to pastor. It wasn't to a missionary. It wasn't to anything other than, Lord, I'll just, I'll I'll live for you. I'll give you everything I have. And that started me on a path that eventually, um, over 10 years later, led me into ministry. Um, But it wasn't, you know, I'm going to go be a pastor it was, I just want to be a faithful man. And that started that path. Yeah. Praise God. And I, I just want to take this moment to praise the Lord. I'm thinking of you coming all the way from the States and I'm coming all the way from Zimbabwe in terms of my origin. And I don't know that we ever would have crossed paths mm-hmm. apart from Jesus Christ and what he's done in our lives and how he is using us in his kingdom. I just want to kick it off here. I am a young uh, husband. I've been married. Let me check the date. Oh, three months and two days. (laughs) (laughs) Congratulations, my friend. Thank you. Getting wiser by the day. You are. You have found favor (laughs) from the Lord. Indeed. You know, I, I joke with my wife and I tell her, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm God's favorite child. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say to people, but I feel like I'm God's favorite because when I look at you, when I spend time with you and how godly you are and how wonderful you are, I have to be at least somewhere up there in the rankings. Yeah. The Lord has been kind to me, brother. Keep telling her that. <laughs> <laughs> and you mentioned being a second generation, uh, sorry, a second generation Christian. Yes, yeah. yes. Second generation Christian. I am a first generation Christian. I have many friends who are in the same boat. And when I spend time with men like you and brother Paul Schleyline and their theological knowledge has such depth to it. And often when handling the scriptures with a seminary background, um, you can feel the weight of the words they're carrying and diving into the Greek and the cross references. And a lot of that uh, is based on how they were brought up and with their seminary education as well. How would you advise a young man who is a husband and he, ha- he doesn't have that? He wasn't raised with the scriptures getting drilled into him and He never had a a seminary background and now is feeling this way, trying to lead his family um, and wanting to rightly handle the word of truth, but feeling like, man, I I can't do it at the level that these other men can. What would you say to someone in that situation? Yeah, I would I would just encourage you to get started, right, just to jump in and grab your Bible, grab a study Bible, grab a notepad and just start reading and studying and do it with a purpose. And in your context, your purpose would be to teach and shepherd your wife, 
you're commanded to do that, Ephesians 5. And so be faithful to that calling in nurturing, shepherding, leading your wife and lead her into the into the green pastures of God's word, right? Don't teach her philosophy and all the history and all those things which have a place, but teach her sound doctrine, right? And, and the blessing of where you are um, in many ways isn't that far removed from where I once was. I, I, I was raised in a Christian home, but I wasn't necessarily poured into maybe at the level that uh, Pastor Paul was. Um, but for me, when I was converted and began a, a, a lifetime of learning, it was really at that point that I really started to grow. And so in some ways, maybe you say I'm getting started late at 19 or 20, but I picked up you know, my Bible and started reading it like I'd never read it before and picked up other works. I know that was when I started to read books like uh, Jonathan Edwards' sermon, Religious Affections, which is crazy now when I look back on it to think that I read that at 19, 20 years old and like, what in the world was I doing? But that was the desire in my heart. I wanted to grow. You have that desire. Now feed it with sound truth, with sound doctrine, right? Go to the scriptures and start feeding that and watch that, that thirst and that hunger for truth only grow even more and the ability to ascertain that and rightly divide it obviously through the spirit's work in your life will grow as well and then as you the key is not to be the tick on the dog's back that's a phrase in west virginia we know well uh ticks are those awful parasites that latch on to a dog or some other host and they just suck the blood out of them and become all swelled up like a pus ball and it's nasty it's gross And sadly, far too many Christians are like ticks on a dog's back where they draw in God's word, but they never give it out. And that's uh, that's first Corinthians 13, where they have the fat head. And uh, that's why I encourage guys all the time. The best thing you can do for your own individual walk is to teach others grow so that you have something to say from God's word and then look for someone to say it to. Well, in your context, God in his mercy has already given you an audience. It's your wife. And so go with a purpose. Go with a passion to know Christ. That's why you should be studying. That's why you should be reading, because you want to grow in your understanding of the Lord and your walk with him. But go with a purpose, and that is so I can help my wife in this. And I will encourage you in this. One of the greatest joys in life, you know, married almost 30 years now, is when you get to grow with your wife. And you have the phenomenal, blessed privilege to not teach her as I am here and you must come along as a dictator or some or some first Peter five lording over her. That's never good and always forbidden in scripture. Um, But it's like, hey, let's learn this together. Let's walk with Christ together. Here's what I'm learning. Here's what I'm seeing. Here's what I've Here's how I've seen Christ in his beauty and majesty today. Let me show you. Oh, brother, that's the recipe. That's the recipe of pure delight in marriage. And so my wife and I have done that for 28 years, and we have no plans of stopping. Uh, we didn't. We weren't uh, theologically well-grounded when we got married. We were obviously saved and, and uh, in love with Christ, but we didn't have a clear uh, anchor of rooted doctrine but that grew in our hearts over years of reading together serving together praying together ministering together and the key was growing together we highly encourage that and you can do that and in many ways ephesians 5 commands us to do that as husbands Mm -hmm. thanks brother and what would you say to the wives in this situation maybe they are second generation christians and had fathers who were excellent in handling the word or roll in uh, in sound circles and their pastors and the older men in the church are wonderful. But then they get home and their husband is trying to figure out the works. He's trying to figure it out and he's trying. What would you say to wives in that situation? Well, I would say their role as designed by God commands that they encourage their husbands, command that they for a lack of a better word, cheer him on, right? That's part of what the helper is to be. She is to be his greatest cheerleader. She is to be his greatest encourager. She is to be his greatest support. She's not to belittle him as if I know more than you. And sometimes that happens because of how you described it. 
right? And that's not uncommon. And her role is obviously to recognize, but for the grace of God, she would be no different than him, right? And so it has nothing to do with her. It's just God's grace in her life. But God has put her with a man in such a way that she can help him. She can not necessarily as being his teacher, but in being his cheerleader, being his supporter, respecting him, honoring him, and loving him so that the role of the wife in its most simple form of submission is to come under her husband and so that she lifts him up so that he can be all that God has called him to be as the leader of her, the leader of that home and the leader in that context, whether it's the church, job, wherever the Lord has him. And so her role is to come under him and in many ways be the fuel in his engine so that he can keep going. And so I would encourage wives, take pressure off your husband, encourage him, praise him, thank him for what he's doing, encourage him in the small steps he takes, find delight in what he delights in as he's delighting in the word. Even if it's something you already know, encourage him in that and thank him for his study and listen and learn from him in ways that maybe you don't even know that you need to learn. Maybe it's his discipline. Maybe it's his diligence. Oftentimes wives um, will uh, sometimes gain truth quicker than husbands do just because of how the mind of a woman works a little bit differently than the mind of a man. And yet watch, uh, I encourage why watch how hard your husband works to gain that knowledge. Watch how disciplined he is to get up early and do that. Praise him for that. Help him in that. Encourage him in that. And uh, you will find your own life blessed. You will find your own life covered under the shadow of the wings that the Lord has given to you in the blessing of this husband. And so, yeah, never, ever discourage. And that's a mistake that young wives will often make in words you might use, looks you might give, comments you might make, jokes you might make. Always strive and and pursue a heart of encouragement and always guard against discouraging your husband. Because oftentimes in that situation, the husband's discouraged enough. He knows he's not where he wants to be, but he's striving to get there. And that should encourage the wife. And you will get there. And oftentimes it doesn't take very long by the Holy Spirit's help. Yes. And I just, I'm very thankful for my wife when it comes to uh, this area of our lives and our time in the word. There are times when I'm approaching a text and I look at it and I'm like, I don't really know. And she won't discourage me as you're speaking about. She'll encourage me. Sometimes she knows it and she graciously and humbly uh, says the answer, gives some input. And I'm so thankful for the way she's been taught. And it's not a, a competition for me to come up above her. We're both trying to learn at the feet of the Lord. Yes. And that's been a blessing. I'll tell you a, a technique that I've seen and, and um, that I've encouraged over the years in situations like this is for the wife to ask questions of the husband, like to be, um, to be proactive in um, not degrading, but in delighting in what the husband uh, has learning and, and do it this way. You know, hey, I, I want to grow in this. I want to grow in my understanding of God's sovereignty. She understands God's sovereignty likely better than the husband, but she wants to grow in it. Will you teach that to me? Will Will you show me some passages where we could study together? And will you teach me and help me understand how God is sovereign, yet man is responsible? Like that's how a wife can do that rather than saying, no, this is what it means that God is sovereign. No, you got that wrong. Ask questions and then give the husband an opportunity to fulfill his role as the teacher in the home. And so literally open the door for him to succeed and say, will you teach me on this? Will you help me grow in this? Because one thing's for sure, she can grow and there's more for her to learn. And the Lord will use that husband in whatever study he's doing in that arena to no doubt teach her and help her. And if she is humble enough to give that over to the husband as she should, she will be blessed by that. And that's just a that's just a non-controversial way of which you can um, provoke that uh, mutual learning. Yes, and I hope our listeners are taking note because in the podcast episode I was recording 
last week with Buddy Paul, he was saying the exact same thing. <laughs> <laughs> that in, in areas of wisdom. Who knew? <laughs> Who knew when you follow the same book and you love the same Lord that you'll say the same thing? Who knew? Exactly. Like, are, are you guys reading this out of a book somewhere? <laughs> one's in Africa, one's in America. <laughs> Kindred spirit. Exactly. And he was sharing how, and you're sharing in regards to the scriptures, and he was sharing in regards to everyday life. And my wife does this as well. I don't know everything. There are many things she knows better than I do and more things she knows in me in some areas. And so she'll graciously and humbly ask questions and I'm walking this direction and she asks a question and I'm like, Hmm, and I start walking that direction and I'm thankful for the wisdom the Lord has given her. I, I think uh, now that you brought this up and, um, I, I, I know because I do a lot of marriage counseling, a lot of premarital counseling, a lot of counseling as a pastor, as a shepherd. And um, this is one of the ways that a godly submissive wife fulfills her role and being in being a helper as well as being heard. Right. It's not like she needs to stand up and her voice needs to be heard and she needs to shout from the rooftop, husband, you're wrong or husband, you're going in the wrong direction. That's not how that works. That's not what first uh, Ephesians five says in respecting your husband. And yet by asking questions of the husband that is respectful, that is a blessing and that is helpful because her voice is being heard. She has a concern. She has a thought. She has an idea, but she's posing it in a way of wisdom which obviously falls right into Proverbs 31 and which is good, which helps the husband. And so where my wife has done that for so long, for so many years, when my wife speaks, I listen, right? I hear what she says in the early years. I didn't, right? It was just like, no, you know, I'm the man I've got to lead. And now it's like my wife starts speaking. I stop talking, right? Because usually it's something profound I need to hear and learn from. And so what a blessing that is. She's, she's my helper. And she'll often see things I don't see or hear things I don't hear or, or like you said, know things I don't know. And what a blessing the Lord gives us those jewels of our wives. Mm. You mentioned you do a lot of marital counseling in the church. If you think about the younger couples and the challenges they may face, are there any bits of wisdom you can give or can you speak of any of the challenges that many young marriages and maybe old ones as well should be thinking about so they can avoid the speed bumps, the potholes, the problems in the road. And in many ways, I think it will still be translatable to Africa because yes. as the saying goes, when America sneezes, the world catches a cold. <laughs> <laughs> we use that saying here. Yeah. Uh, we were often importing in this globalized world, but even deeper than that, everyone has sin in their heart Absolutely. and everyone is a sinner. We're, we're, we're all the same. Exactly. We have a common father uh, in Adam. And so do you have any thoughts on that? Absolutely. I would say when it comes to life of which marriage is a big part, um, conflict, controversy, problems are common to all, right? Being a man is born of a woman and full of trouble, right? We understand that sin resides in our heart. It, it is the culture in which we live, the context in which we live. It's all around us. We can't get away from it. Yeah, marriage is really the weaving together of two sinners who are on the road to becoming saints, right? And so you're going to have potholes. You're going to have pitfalls. You're going to fail. You're going to say things you regret. You're going to need to repent. You're going to need to forgive. This is the road we live as human beings, as Christians, as as spouses. So I would just encourage couples all the time that problems in whatever form they come in, whether it's difficulty in life, whether it's personal sin, whether it's problems with child rearing, whether it's even communication misunderstandings between spouses, every single problem we face is an opportunity to be purified by God. And that's why marriage is one of the um, most personal means of grace for the maturation of the individual and the couple. And that idea is often forgotten in marriage, that the times of misery that we go through, whether it's the sickness of a child, the death of a loved one, or even the personal sin choices we make that bring difficulty into our lives, 
every single one of those things under the sovereign grace of God are really going to be used by God if we'll submit to him as milestones of maturity in our life. And so when we run into a roadblock, a pitfall, a speed bump, as you described it, we have to remember in marriage that this is an opportunity for us to grow, right? This miscommunication, this misunderstanding, or even this difficulty we're facing, whatever that is, we we must not let it have the best of us. We must submit to the scriptures and submit to the process that God lines out for reconciliation, for for better communication, or for lack of a better word, for better repentance. And if we do, guess what happens? We grow in our relationship with one another, right? That's the beauty of Matthew 18 and that reality of if your brother sins against you, go and confront him. And and if he repents, what does the text say? You've won your brother back. And what that means and how that works in real life is your relationship with your brother is far stronger now than it was before, right? And so it is in marriage. Every one of the speed bumps, pitfalls, potholes, how you describe them that my wife and I have gone through have actually, every one of them, have actually turned out to be blessings in our life. Blessings we would have never chosen, blessings we didn't want to go through, but blessings we had to go through if we were going to be steeled in our resolve, you know, if we were going to be strengthened in our commitment, and if we were going to be deepened in our love for one another. Every time we go through an issue and we forgive one another or we grow through the communication issue or whatever it is, every time we do that, my love for my wife grows stronger. Her love for me grows stronger. She sees I'm not going to leave. She sees I'm going to work this out. I see that she truly respects me and loves me despite the stupid thing I might have said or the disrespectful attitude I might have had towards her or whatever. And and I ask her to forgive me and she's so willing to forgive me. And then she sees vice versa, the way it works. All that does is deepen our commitment from the surface level, which is where it always begins, to now we're, we're driving roots of Christ-like love for one another. And that's what it's all about. And as, as James 1 and Romans 5 says, we can't grow in that Christ-like commitment without conflict, without controversy. And so marriage is going to involve that, parenting all the more. And we must see that our goal isn't necessarily the complete absence of that. While we strive to live in holiness, which will bring a lot of absence of it, we must understand that some of that will come and it's part of God's design to grow us. And that's a huge perspective to gain. Sanctification is a huge plan for every marriage, and we must never forget that. Amen. And as we draw to a close, just a a couple more questions. One is on the parenting side now. I'm thinking of uh, friends of mine who are parents, and uh, you mentioned you have sons, and how does Thank you for joining us for the first half of this episode of Missionary Minds. To catch the second half, join us next Family Friday as we continue with more lessons for young husbands and fathers. 